I say this every week, but it is lovely to see so many familiar faces and to welcome some new ones. Uh, it's my delight this morning, this afternoon, to uh, welcome Sophia Lamias. Um, yes. Have I said it right? Lamias. Lamias, sorry. Um, who's going to talk to us about uh, Carmelite uh, spirituality and the contemplative tradition of John of the Cross and Teresa of Lamias. Um, I, I, I'm not going to say a great deal more because he's going to introduce himself and his background, his background. But uh, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you. I'll just check the. Is that uh, all right? Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Am I mic'd up? Very good. Well, um, basically, I. Uh, I've, at the moment I'm doing various jobs. I have a small job with a small Catholic charity. It's part-time. I'm also a translator and uh, I'm also writing a book about the uh, ideology of the Holocaust. And um, I uh, did a doctorate here some years ago in history of ideas, which is when, where this came from, this interest. I've been a Carmelite, a secular Carmelite, which I'll explain, for 15 years. And uh, the name is actually from Yorkshire. Some people think it's Blamires from Spain. It's actually a Bradford name. Sometimes find it without the S in my. Now we live in a very su success-oriented culture. My son, who's a lawyer out in Silicon Valley at the moment, working with, you know, the entrepreneurs that we all know about, tells me that the big thing out there at the moment is failure seminars. That is to say, all these celebrated entrepreneurs all say, well, we had to fail before we could succeed. That's part of the, that's part of the necessary course. Failures are seen as necessary ingredients for success. And I find that very interesting because I'm very aware of the vast numbers of people who uh, aren't a success in worldly terms. And I would count myself among those. Way back in the 1990s, I hit rock bottom in my life. And if I begin by talking about this, the reason is that it's what eventually led me to Carmel. I'm going to give you a personal experience of Carmel. And I think it's very appropriate and a centre for spiritual growth because I can truly say that Carmel has been at the heart of my spiritual growth in the last 15 years. And probably even before because lots of things happen inside that you don't know about. <laughs> when I say hit rock bottom, I'm talking not the conventional story of drugs and drink and marriage separation, living on the street. I'm talking about failure in my attempts to build a career. Because I'd taken this decision way back at the age of 17, I'd offered my life to God. I won't go into all that happened after that. But I assumed it was like a contract. Okay, I knew God didn't give you um, money and, you know, worldly, sort of, uh, all the worldly glamour and so forth. But I assumed somehow that he'd, the return would be that he'd give me a life that was, you know, reasonably successful and, uh, that there would be a comeback. So when I found myself in my 40s, unemployed for the third time, and increasingly confused, I began to get rather upset. I thought, <clears throat> why is God throwing away my life? It's the only one I've got. I became a Catholic at 30, and I continued to practice my faith. Up to this time, I'd always been able to see some make some sense of, of the direction my life was going in. It just seemed to be going forward in some way. But now, I was lost. I couldn't see the point of anything. But from time to time, memories of a book would come to me. A book that I'd read long before. It was called The Ascent of Karma by St. John of the Cross. And there was an idea in that which somehow seeped in about darkness. 
His phrase, the dark night of the soul, which I don't think I really understood. But I somehow felt that John of the Cross would help me to find God in the dark, which is where I was. Then one day I came across a leaflet about the secular Carmelites. Secular Carmelites are a group of lay people who follow the spirit of the Carmelites while living not in community but um, out in the world. It's like the Oblates the Benedictines have and the Third Order of the, the Tertiaries of the Franciscans mm -hmm. and so forth. So knowing that St. John the Cross had been a Carmelite, I was very attracted and joined the St. Elijah community. Now the Carmelite Order has one particular extraordinary distinction. It is the only order in the Catholic Church that was first founded in the Holy Land. The first Carmelites known to historical record were hermits living on Mount Carmel in the 12th century. Carmelite tradition likes to trace the origins of the order back to Elijah, which is pushing it a bit, I have to admit, but he had this strong association with Mount Carmel. The tradition is regarded by many today as being a bit dodgy, but you know, I like the words of a professor of medieval history in Cambridge. He was wont to say, if there's an ancient tradition about something, and no evidence to contradict it, then I believe it. <laughs> if you go to Mount Carmel today, you'll find a Carmelite monastery with a chapel built around a cave in which Elijah is reputed to have lived. Can you imagine, I've been to this chapel, and if you imagine you have the altar raised above and the cave beneath, so you're facing this cave. It's close to Haifa in Israel. Tradition relates that hermits lived on Mount Carmel from the time of Elijah, um, who is thought to have had a school of prophets. You know, they initiated a school of prophets who became hermits. In the 13th century, some of the hermits began to live in a community around a chapel, and then they asked St. Albert, who was the Bishop of Jerusalem, to compose a rule for their common life. And this became, and remains, the rule of the Carmelites. The last remnants who remained over, over there were massacred as they were singing the Salve Regina in 1291 by uh, the Saracens. Well, in Europe, they became mendicant friars. They joined the mendicant friar orders, order. Uh, mendicants means, mendicant means begging, of course. And the Franciscans were the ones, I think, who founded the mendicant tradition. Uh, they were supposed to live not on the produce of their estates, like many monasteries did, but from gifts solicited from the people. In Europe, the Carmelites were devoted to the contemplative life, to preaching, teaching, spiritual counselling and spreading the gospel. The first communities of Carmelite sisters didn't come into being until 1452. They had a different charism from the friars, but they were enclosed. They were to be seen as a prayer powerhouse backing the work of the friars. St. Teresa of Avila entered the Carmelite convent of the Incarnation in 1535 in Avila, and she found a way of life which seemed to her significantly below the standard that the rule called for. Apart from anything else, there were well over a hundred sisters, which did make life a bit chaotic. And I quote from one historian who describes the life in that convent. Lady boarders came and went as they pleased. Visits and long conversations with relatives and friends were tolerated, almost as if the place were a fashionable hotel instead of a convent. The true spirit of prayer and recollection having been lost, the income of the house had fallen with its spiritual tone until there was not even enough to buy food for the nuns. Most of them went to the homes of relatives to eat every day. Remember, this was supposed to be enclosed. So this is what led Teresa to found a new movement for reform that became known as the Discalce Carmelites, or sometimes as the Theresian Carmel. They have the letters OCD after their name. Discalce means shoeless, not wearing shoes. And it symbolises the strongly ascetic spirit of Teresa's reform. Ironically, this gets very confusing, modern Discalce Carmelites do allow themselves to wear shoes. <coughs> so they're shoeless, but shoe-wearing. 
You have to think of this as symbolic. The cows, all shoe-wearing Carmelites, who didn't go along with Teresa's reform, have continued in existence as a separate order down to the present day, and they regard themselves as the Carmelites of the ancient observance, which again may be confusing. By the way, they have the letters O Carm after their name. If you may have seen that, O Carm, uh, discussed as OCD. Apart from St. Teresa and St. John of the Cross, celebrated spiritual guides well known today who are members of the Discalced Order include Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection, author of the spiritual classic called The Practice of the Presence of God, St. Therese of Lisieux, also known as the Little, Little Flower, St. Teresa Benedictor of the Cross, better known as the Jewish convert Edith Stein. Her decision to become a Catholic was triggered by Teresa of Avila's autobiography, which she came across at the house of a friend. And also Blessed Elizabeth of the Trinity, shortly to be canonised. I was very moved when reading about Pope St. John Paul II to discover that in his early years as a priest, he asked his bishop, please may I become a Carmelite? to release him from service in the Darsen priesthood. And the bishop said no. Some years later he asked him again. And the bishop said no again. And the rest, as they say, is history. But I believe that he did wear the scapula all his life, which I'll come to in a moment. So it was the discussed Carmelites seculars that I joined in quest for spiritual growth in 2002. The St. Elijah community meets at Boars Hill Priory, just outside Oxford. The Carmelites, of course, had had a community in Oxford before the Reformation. And indeed, they had a chapel, I gather, on the south side of St. Mary Magdalene's Church, just down the road. Around 1289, Edward I gave the royal palace of Beaumont to the friars, which stood in the angle of Beaumont Street and Walton Street. And an early leader of the Carmelites, as they established themselves in Europe, was St. Simon Stock, an Englishman, thought to have been a student at this university. It is said that he kept on pestering Our Lady for some special privilege for the Carmelites, that they liked to have something special that would distinguish them. And one day she appeared to him in a vision, holding the scapula in her hand. It's a piece of brown cloth, which is hung from the neck, traditionally associated with the Carmelites. You wear it either as a large piece outside your clothing, or as a small piece under your clothing. So I'm rather delighted to know an Englishman did play such a very important part in the early world of Carmel, which of course is very often associated with Spain, understandably. Carmelites returned to Oxford in the 20th century when they bought a house on Boar's Hill. By the way, not just any old house. It had belonged to the poet laureate, Robert Bridges, a devout Christian and hymn writer who had, um, among other things, his claim to fame was he um, published posthumously poetry of Gerard Manley Hopkins and is thought to have made his reputation. If you're looking for somewhere to go, Balls Hill Prime is very good, if you can find it. Even with sat -nows, people have been known to get lost up there. So nearly 15 years ago, I found my way to Balls Hill and the karma. Motivated by the darkness and confusion I felt about the desert of failure into which God had led me, and by the sense that in order to find my way forward in the darkness, I needed to find some sort of community where I'd be helped to grow spiritually. Another thing that was in my mind at the time was I'd done a great deal of reading the spiritual classics, but I realised I wasn't really doing it. It's so easy to become an expert in the spiritual classics, but uh, in fact, they used to ask me, when I started, they kept saying, I think you should read this up, all that. I said, no, I've done enough reading, I want to do it now. I think they got a bit frustrated with me. Anyway, later on, I came back to the books. And um, one thing that um, astonished me over the years was, you know, I got a bit frustrated when I first started because there wasn't much chance to socialise. And I thought, yeah, well, I came here, get help, to learn with others, to find God, uh, all we do is pray and discuss spiritual works. But I realised after a while that some sort of mysterious bond was developing through this and that I had a very shallow notion of friendship and um, spiritual connection. 
And I realised that if you open yourself to God's grace in the way that you were doing, if you, what you're doing is like opening a kind of door through which God's grace can come. St. Therese of Lisieux, I like to say, tout est grâce, everything is grace. It's one of those phrases that you can sort of hear and it doesn't really go in. But I began to understand what she meant in karma. There's also a beautiful sentence associated with Blessed Elizabeth of the Trinity. Let yourself be loved. Let yourself be loved. The God problem, the problem that we have with God, is actually not about God, it's about ourselves. Because we insist on putting obstacles in the way of the graces that he wants to give us, or of his desire to teach us and fill us. God, as I read somewhere, wants to give us more than we even ever dream of asking for. I spoke earlier about the source of our unity is lying in our prayer and in our common purpose. What is the common purpose of karma? Well, not long ago I was chatting to one of our members who is Italian. He spends half his time in Italy, Florence, would you believe it, and the other half in Oxford. And uh, that's work, because of work. He belongs to Carmelite groups both there and here, so he gets a double dose. And he said to me, you know, Carmel, it's not just about having an interest, it's a love affair with God. Now it would be easy for me to tell you that this is the essence of Carmel, that which distinguishes Carmel from other religious movements, but of course um, it's you could apply it to others as well. I'm not saying that's unique, but it certainly is at the heart of karma. And love, of course, is at the heart of the Catholic and other Christian mainstream traditions. I was very struck by the fact that when Pope Benedict came to the UK a few years ago, he took to the motto of his visit some words of uh, Blessed John Henry Newman, heart speaks to heart. Core ad core loquitur. The Catholic Church does major on the heart. We recently had the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and then after that, the Feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. I can't bottle up the essence of karma and present it to you. I've read books where they've tried to do so, and it's very elusive. But certainly I would say that karma is about having a passionate, romantic, intense, and crazy love affair with God. And you find the source of this, of course, among other things, in the Song of Songs, in Hebrew tradition, and also to some extent in the Old Testament prophets. So I don't, I'm not going to talk to you about techniques of meditation, I think you've probably had quite a few, quite a lot of input over your turn about that. Because karma is really about something different. It's about cultivating and enjoying a love relationship with a person, the person, Jesus Christ. St. Therese of Lisieux said, I am love at the heart of the Church. Now the Carmelite rule is one of the simplest of all those in the religious orders of the Catholic Church. Um, part of it, as far as the seculars go, part of it is, uh, part of our activity is praying uh, together in both joining in the uh, prayers of the Church, the Universal Catholic Church, the uh, evening prayer, the so pray night prayer in our meetings, and uh, it's also personal prayer at home. And you could say it's very much about looking and sharing as it is about thinking or pondering or reflecting. When you are in love, you take pleasure in just looking at the face of the person you love. I think the mother-infant relationship is a wonderful example. How the mother loves to gaze at her newborn baby. Such rapture. And the baby just gazes back. I'm um, very blessed because I'm supervising a lady who's doing a thesis to compare the mother-infant relationship with the relationship of God with us. And it is a truly wonderful topic made me think about the mother-infant relationship much more. So Carmelite prayer is about gazing at the face of Christ. 
For we know that he is forever looking at us and uh, waiting for us to return the look, the gaze. Carmelite prayer is about, also about having a conversation with God. This is how St. Teresa defined prayer. And her defini definition has actually found its way into the Catholic Catechism. I love the fact that Teresa, who had no university training in her or higher education, was declared a doctor of the church by Pope Paul VI in 1970. Because in spiritual matters, of course, um, academics are not the be-all and the end-all. I was going to say they're not important. Actually, they can be. Teresa herself is interesting. You'll find she, of course, she went to confessors because for her that was a way of, not only a way of um, asking God's forgiveness, but also a way of talking about her spiritual experiences. And they represented to her the the the, um, the view or the reaction of the church. So she, she had many um, very strong experiences, but she wanted others to advise her how she should respond to them. Um, and she, she does mention several times she did like them to be learned or well-read. She didn't like um, stupid confessors. And I love there's another remark she made somewhere about um, nuns when she was recruiting sisters. She said, you know, I can teach them a lot of things, but I can't teach them common sense. So Carmel has helped me immeasurably in my prayer life. It's also helped me to negotiate the darkness I spoke about at the beginning. It's not that I found a solution to the darkness problem, a sort of blazing light. Actually, what I found in St. John of the Cross was it's okay to be in the dark. You know, so often when you're suffering or struggling, you're kind of struggling to get out, to be back to normal, what you think of as normal. But he says, it's okay. Just, this is where God has put you. The way he thinks of, the way St. John of the Cross thinks is, if you say to Jesus, I'm definitely going to follow you. He reply, okay, let's see what you are made of. Are you serious? And you'll be put to the test. Of course, you recall where Jesus said, if we want to follow him, we have to take up our cross. A lot of the times, of course, we don't really want to believe that. And the other times, I sometimes think, you know, I've got a sort of limited number of crosses that are okay, I can handle those, but just not that one. Not that one, please. And sometimes that one does come because it's what God decides, not what I decide. But some people present the gospel as though following Jesus will solve your problem, all your problems. And I think that's how I thought when I first became a, when I first responded to the call of God as a young man. Ask Jesus into your heart, he'll fill it with love, joy, and peace. And someone asks Jesus into his heart or her heart encounters trials and obstacles and temptations, and starts to feel guilty. What's wrong with my faith? So in addition to the sufferings you're having, you then have guilt on top. It's not what St. John of the Cross says, the truth may be the exact opposite. Your determination is being put to the test. I'm afraid I can't possibly do justice to John of the Cross's complex teaching about the dark night in this talk. Um, which I've tried to focus on the things which really have spoken to me. One of the most astonishing things about his life is that he was actually imprisoned. And this is where it gets very difficult to imagine to go back to life in 16th century Spain for us. Because of his enthusiasm for the discalced reform movement launched by Teresa, a group of Carmelites opposed to the reform actually imprisoned him. And they kept telling him, just leave it. We don't want it. And he said no. He refused. So they actually flogged him and put him into a cell 10 feet by 6 feet in a Carmelite monastery. It's hard to imagine yourself back into that, into that world. But uh, eventually he had to make a dramatic escape. It fascinated me because when I first read this I thought, you know, if anyone did that to me I'd be off and blow you Carmelites. 
he didn't show the slightest sense of bitterness, and in fact, he managed to compose some of his poetry in imprisonment, poetry which has been uh, relished for hundreds of years. The darkness can be productive. Teresa too knew the darkness. She tells us she prayed for 18 years without receiving any consolation. And she regards those 18 years as very important. She is famous for her mystical experiences. She's recorded by witnesses as having levitated in prayer. She had numerous visions. But she was embarrassed when such things happened. And said, no, no, that's not, that's not what it's about. She taught that if mystical experiences are given, it is simply so that we may love God more and serve him better. And I often think of this, if you ever catch any of those televangelist programs on the telly, you know, it's all about miracles. They want miracles. People love miracles. They think that um, people will respond to Jesus if they see a miracle. I had a very sobering experience myself. The only, probably the only person I know of in my life who really did have a miracle in fact, uh, remained hardened to God and has done down to the present day. So I know that it doesn't necessarily have that effect. It's like the ten lepers who were healed, only one came back. So when, if it's okay to be in the dark, in these difficult situations, confused, uncertain, um, it's very psychologically very healing. It helps you to de-stress. Stress is so terrible today, isn't it? A lot of it is because I think I should be somewhere else. My situation is not right. I should get out of it. Whereas if we could see God's hand in whatever difficult things we're going through, um, that's healing. I often get to the middle of the day. All my plans have gone astray. Nothing's working. And so I think to myself, okay, my plans, let go of those. What's God's plan? And it's very healing. Because when it comes to God's dealings with us, we're in mystery. Um, you have to let go of trying to understand, which is a strange place to say. It's a strange thing to say in this city of learning. And uh, as a Carmelite, I remain as pro-learning as I ever was. But the person who pursues learning has to recognise the limits to what we can ever know. Natural theology can take us only so far. Then we have recourse to the theology of revelation. But in respect of God's dealings with ourselves, very often, mystery. What a great English mystical writer calls the cloud of unknowing. St. John of the Cross also brought my attention to the long tradition of Christian thinking known as apophatic theology. The theology of the ineffable mystery of God. The theology that says God is so far beyond our understanding that we can only say what he is not. For our limited and sinful state means that if we draw close to God, we're likely to be dazzled. We will be dazzled. Can you tell the difference between being dazzled by the light and being unable to see in the dark? Either way, the situation is the same. And sometimes, I think, again, it's been a great consolation to me when I've, I thought as I grow older, I thought I'd know more and more answers and help people, but I seem to be more and more uncertain. But this is a consolation because it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not closer to God. Perhaps it's a dazzlement that is affecting you. Teresa, I could wax lyrical about her. We celebrated her 500th anniversary of her birth last year. Had a wonderful time. Truly extraordinary woman. So powerful is her writing that in Spain she's held as a great literary figure. Personality that shines through is a delight. In her letters, you're likely, quite likely to find a disquisition on some sacred topic followed by a recipe or a um, medical recommendation. She was actually beautiful, feisty, and endowed with a charming sense of humour. I love the story of the Bishop of Avila, who, when he first heard about this crazy reform project, that he wanted to found a convent in his diocese, he said, no way! No, she's not coming here near me. He never met her. Somebody introduced him to her, and uh, the historian says he was captivated by her simplicity, her sincerity, her quiet intensity of purpose, 
her humility without civility, her human and more than human charm and power. From that day on, he was her loyal and unflinching friend until he died. And to capital, his dear man asked in his will, please may I be buried next to Teresa? Isn't that a wonderful story? She founded 13 new convents in her lifetime and inspired several foundations for friars. That bald statement tells you nothing about the sufferings that, that cost her, long rides down awful roads, often in winter snow, opposition she had from many quarters. The problem with the mendicant friars was, you see the townspeople, someone comes along and says, okay, I'm going to found a new convent. It's going to be mendicant. They're Immediately they thought, well, who's going to give you the money? You're going to ask it from us. No thanks. We've got enough of that already. So the Carmelites contemplative, as I said, a powerhouse for um, supporting the friars. In addition to the usual vows of chastity, poverty and obedience, this required times of silence, periods spent in cells meditating on the things of God, fasting from the Feast of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross on the 14th of September to Easter, a vegetarian diet and manual labour. No member of the community could own any private property. If a nun became attached to anything material, the prioress would ask her, give it up, please. Again, I quote from the biography of Teresa. The original rule was designed to permit those who desired to follow Christ's counsels of perfection literally to do so with the least possible interference from their own human nature, from friends and relatives, and from the outside world in general. So enclosure was very strict. And someone who writes very well about this is Ruth Burroughs, who might have come across her books. Quote, we recall St. John of the Cross's emphasis on the value of the church and the, the value to the church and the world at large of the purely contemplative life when lived to the full, allowing divine love to take possession. And she quotes St. John of the Cross, There is no better or more necessary work than love. There is no better or more necessary work than love. For a very little of this pure love is more precious in the sight of God and the soul, and of greater value and profit to the church, even though the soul appear to be doing nothing, than are all other works together. I have to say it reminds me of that wonderful gospel story of the lady who took the expensive perfume and broke it over the feet of Jesus. And Vatican Council reinforced this, quote, institutes which are entirely ordered towards contemplation in such a way that their members give themselves over to God alone, in solitude and silence, in constant prayer and willing penance, have a hidden apostolic fruitfulness. Hidden. Um, things tend to be ignored if they're hidden in the world today. I just think of the fate of the unborn hidden from the world inside of the womb and how casual, casually they're treated. Uh, Ruth Burroughs also explains how Teresa and those of her, of her kind saw enclosure as a way to create a desert like that of the Desert Fathers, which I find fascinating. You know, the Desert Fathers in the early days of the church who literally went into the desert. You couldn't do that in the city. In the desert, writes Ruth Burroughs, the human heart is deprived of many, many things that would protect it from the fierce rays of the sun or the biting winds. Exposed to God sooner or later, ex its experience will be of spiritual indigence, helplessness and sinfulness. In the world, one can be bolstered up by the affirmation of friends, a career of diverse interests, intense activity, to name a few of the things whereby we tend to hide from ourselves and acquire a persona with which to face the world. The desert strips us of all these pseudo-faces. I think that's fascinating that we sort of bolster up something which is a little bit... We need other people to bolster us up because we're afraid to face the full reality of ourselves. Probably the theme of mercy is a great one there. God's mercy. We should have no fear of revealing ourselves. What this extraordinary 16th century Spanish nun taught me was to look for God within myself. One of her classic writings is called The Interior Castle. She depicts the soul as a crystal castle 
in this wonderful crystal castle, mind bending, and describes the journey inward as a journey through the rooms of that castle. Studying that book in our Carmelite community made me realise that I always paid lip service to the idea that God was within me. I persistently tended to think of him as being out there somewhere. Just a few points about Teresa's exposition of the search for God as a journey inwards. First, I think it's immensely encouraging. You don't have to go to India or Nepal or somewhere exotic, as people used to do, to find a guru. Nor do you have to resort to allegedly mind-expanding drugs that hold out the promise of taking you into some other dimension. You can find God wherever you are by embarking on that quest to find him within. Second, it's also in some ways blindingly simple. Anybody can do it. What you need above all for that journey is determination. Sheer resolve not to give up. Seek and you shall find, said the Lord. Ask and you'll receive. Knock and it'll be open to you. Third, no esoteric wisdom is required. You can look to the guidance of Jesus, the scriptures, the teaching of the church. For Teresa, the Catholic context was important for many reasons. One of the reasons I've said was it allowed your private inspirations and revelations to be tested against the wisdom of the collective. Private revelations, as we all know, can be very dangerous if uh, they go, if the person who receives them can become a cult leader and it does terrible damage and of course he leads others astray because religion is very powerful. It's a very, very powerful influence. And so um, the individual needs the collective as a balance. Fourth, this journey in which is not about getting off on spiritual highs or ecstasies. Teresa tells us they may be given but they're not the main point. The main point is to focus on God within you, to open yourself to God's action. Fifth, prayer is not about pursuing a thing or a state of mind like deeper absorption in reality or wisdom, both of which may in fact come about, but they're not the main purpose. As I said, it's a love relationship with the person. Teresa was very much in favour of making the humanity of Christ, his human life, his human actions, a focus for meditation. Sixth, there is the moral question. If you want to approach a holy God, you have to aspire at least to be holy yourself. And this is a battle, it's a constant one, and, uh, but one you cannot avoid. By this time, one could be excused for wondering, well, if I'm, not, if I'm not sure of any special experiences, if I can't be sure of a wow factor, if it's all just a wow, well, what's the point? So we come back to the purpose of our existence. In Catholic and mainstream thinking, human beings are wired, hardwired to find God. It's in there to look for God. It's in their DNA. But what Teresa and St. John of the Cross remind us of is that we have to put God first to find him. When you read St. John of the Cross, you're left in no doubt about one thing. God doesn't reveal himself to half-hearted people. This is about detachment. You have to walk God badly. So following the Carmelite path is less to do with methods and techniques or gurus, more to do with cultivating an attachment, an inner attachment to God, to the heart of God, which involves an inner detachment from what this world can offer. I love the story of uh, the feeding of the 5,000 because the little boy is one of my heroes, because you may start off thinking, well, I sort of want God, but I'm, it's only very little, you know, and want lots of other things. You have to offer what you have. Like the boy offered his, his uh, pathetic little lunch to feed 5,000. That's what he had. So when I came to Carmel, I was, you know, mm, not sure how much I can put into this. If you make that initial offering and pursue it, he will multiply it and deepen it. It's no surprise that St. John of the Cross expresses his experience and his feelings in poetry, the supreme language of love. It's also suited to express paradox, and paradox lies at the heart of the theology of John of the Cross. His poem, The Living Flame of Love, is all about the wound of love. 
The first lines are, O living flame of love, that tenderly wounds my soul at its deepest centre. Tenderly wounds? What kind of paradox is that? We normally think of love as healing wounds, as a bar. One reason why John of the Cross says is that love awakens longing. You know, you, you kind of mosing along, you've got a reason to be happy life, you're not too bothered, and then, you know, you know, suddenly this longing can start. It's disruptive, it's disturbing. Of course, even romantic love resembles this, because you may want to be united with your beloved, but you can, it's never perfect, as you know, in this world, it's never, it's always limited. Something um, prevents it from perfection. And I'd like to read you a poem on longing as the way to God, which is very beautiful, by a secular Carmelite friend named Deborah Hawley. This poem was inspired by a radio program when a gentleman named Stephen Hawkins, that I think will be known to all of you, was being interviewed, and he stated that he thought the existence of God was an unnecessary hypothesis. The poem is called Wild Geese. The print is a bit feeble, a bit feeble on this. Why did the universe begin? What is Earth's story? I heard today Professor Hawking thinks you are unnecessary to the discussion regarding beginnings, origins and causes. So faith and physics don't inform each other? It could never be so. The mystery of your being is even less accessible to my mind than the story of the universe. You, unfathomable, more than an ocean in which I am a drop. Last evening I heard a sound and saw a moment of Earth's rotation in the dance and sent something like a long-remembered scent, bypassing thought and entering my depth. High above me I heard the calls and responses of flying geese. They flew in formation, perfectly arranged to cut most effectively through the air, each one a part of the whole and each calling to the others. Their passing was so fast they seem set to arc over the Earth's surface, making her thousands of miles just a moment beneath their wings. Oh there, I ached with longing, and a cry rose up for who? I could not name you. I think I did not seem to be taken by this, but I know there is a way, heaven help us, there is a way to sound the unfathomable. There is a way to fly to you. It is a way of longing, beyond longing, and crying till the tears are spent. It involves a letting go, letting go, leaving safety, and flying beyond the limits of our sight and strength. So longing itself is a way to find God. So, just a final thought really about providence, well I've already spoken about this, um, the paradox of um, believing that God is in everything that happens to you. So important I think, very calm right. I learned this wonderful phrase, the adorable providence in calm. Instead of complaining of what happens to me, Look for God, because God is in it. The other little phrase I learned in Carmel is very useful, is Hallelujah, anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah, anyway. It's all gone wrong. I can, want to just finish with another lovely poem about the darkness, and finding God in the darkness, by the same author. It's called Dialogue in November. Why is the song empty in the bare-boned trees? It is only the darkness of autumn and the sound of rain on leaves. Just the thin wind that stings my face, making me turn and creep to earth. For the night comes early now, and there is small hope of comfort when the fruit turns bitter and mists linger on the grass. My heart won't rise to meet you now. I only seek the sheltered places where still I cannot rest but pace and fret and sigh because it's late, too late. 
and no reply comes from those fallen in the mud who have not conquered. But don't I know the victory is yours, and all the love the sad world needs is there a breath away, and all his gift and good and grace and held in you, dear image of the unseen God. But now the year is turning, I strain to see it. It is coming dark, and one by one the stars go out. Each point of light expires, and nothing guides my feet as I descend the rain-soaked steps. If there's a lamp which burns within, I do not know it. It's as though no guide came here. So how to trust you now? You, unseen, unsensed, unlit. Now the light's moved on, leaving us to gloom. I will go on. Your word and witness is my guide. Though mist you'd never lift, and I will pray you make it so that I may stay in you and you in me, my hidden guest. With all the love I seek to have, I call to you, my Lord, and falling through the void, I say, yes, now this heart is ready, and so awake the dawn. Thank you. This music important in the calm life. I would not say it was central or essential. Um, some of the poems of John of the Cross have been set to music and are, are, are very much appreciated. Um, but I certainly don't think it's a big thing. Anna, you know, what do you think? Yeah. Anna is a member of our St. Elijah community. Honestly, I don't really know, but I think music is another way of praying to God. And if you're scripted in that, I think, why not? <laughs> but it's more an emphasis on silence, isn't it? Yeah. I must say, my personal experience is that there is a, a growing need, a desire, a longing for silence. There is a, a yearning because of the way we lead our lives, perhaps. Funnily enough, I myself didn't have a longing for silence. I've, for years I've lived actually a very quiet life. Not, not very stressed either. My late wife was, uh, was a doctor, ironically. We actually got married in this church. 
And she was at, at Somerville over the road. But um, she lived a very stressful life. And so I think it was probably a good thing I didn't because um, I was able to absorb some of her stress. But I think there are certainly, I think there are two broad ways that people do come to Carmel. One is through a desire to deepen their prayer life, which is often about a desire to learn to pray silent prayer. And the other, which I think is more my way, was about darkness, you know, finding yourself confused and wanting to find someone who, who could be a guide to help you in uh, difficult times. And silent prayer is certainly something that took me a long time to come to terms with. It was a big effort that uh, probably some of you here find it a very natural thing. I like to talk. somehow in this silence of, of a bond was forged between us, which was quite extraordinary, transcended sort of personality attractions or anything like that. Something very deep, sympathy, and uh, almost sometimes a tenderness. Celebration. The canonization? No. No, 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 no. The statue. 
stuff. Oh, oh yes, I meant to mention that. With piercing arms. She had this vision that the, that an angel had pierced her heart. And Bernini's statue, yeah. you know, I've seen pictures of it. It's called the Transfiction or the Transverberation of yes. Teresa. Mm. We, we actually had celebrations here as well. Oh, did you? Yeah. Uh, and, um, Romans was one person, Peter Tyler, gave a very, very good lecture as well in this church. So, uh, yeah. If, if anybody is interested in uh, learning more about the Carmelite tradition, uh, Boar's Hill has been referred to, and I know at least one member of this congregation um, goes fairly regularly to retreats, as are often there. It's, it's open to Catholics, obviously, but not necessarily. And um, I, from this person, I hear nothing but good. Uh, so I, there are some leaflets at the back of prayer, um, come up prayer and retreats this year. So please, please take one if you'd like to. I want to thank you warmly for your generosity in sharing your personal experience, that's not something anybody can do. So thank you for that. And uh, for making it uh, alive, the experience that you've been through. Uh, so, yeah. Very good, thank you. Thank you so much.